Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's SETS online webinar. My, my name is Mariano Ramirez, and I'm going to moderate today's talk. Before we get started with today's webinar, I, we would like to thank our sponsorship from the International Association of Segmentologists, which allow us to offer all these resources free of charge. Please check the webpage for more resources that we have available there. Um, make sure and check out our website for this information, as I said. So today's lecture is by Concha Arena Abad from the Departamento de Ciencias de la Tierra, the Earth Science Department of the University of Zaragoza. Concha received his bachelor degree and her PhD from the University of Zaragoza, and now she's working in the Institute of Environmental Sciences of Aragon, also in the University of Zaragoza. Her current research focuses mainly on continental sequence stratigraphy, cyclostratigraphy, and stable isotopes, and today she is going to talk us about the potential of pluvial carbonates as archives of climate and environmental conditions. So Concha, the stage is yours. You can start wherever you want. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for joining me for this webinar on the potential of fluvial carbonates as archives of climate and environmental conditions. Well, before we get into the information, I'd like to acknowledge all the colleagues uh, who have contributed to or participated in this research, whose names appear on the screen. Research on quaternary and present uh, fluvial carbonates in Northeast Iberia has been funded by several grants by the Spanish Ministry and the University of Zaragoza over almost 20 years. The main focus will be on present fluvial uh, carbonate systems as natural laboratories. I'll show you the varied information we can get through the periodical study or monitoring of several or different parameters. After that, I'd like to explain an example of past TUFA uh, records to explore their potential as the positional hydrological and climatic indicators with some examples from uh, the Northeast of Spain. Here is what uh, we'll be covering in this webinar. First, uh, what are TUFAs? Then the factors that control TUFA formation and the scales of study. Then how present uh, sedimentary systems are key to understanding past scenarios with several uh, parts here. And uh, then a comparison with past fluvial laminated deposits. And I'll finish up with some uh, remarks and results. As I guess you are familiar with the TUFA concept and the controlling factors, I'll go through these points quickly, but feel free to ask me later if you need further information. Well, let's get started by looking at what TUFAs are. TUFAs are calcium carbonate deposits formed in ambient temperature conditions in relation to plants and prokaryotic organisms in springs, rivers, and lakes, in, uh, where uh, uh, CO2 in water is of meteoric origin. So we need aquatic flora, calcium, and bicarbonate with a sufficient, sufficient calcite saturation state. Here you can see tufa formed by calcite precipitation on plants later broken and transported. Note to serve internal and external uh, molds. In this case, tufa formed by calcite precipitation on downgrowing plants. We can see here hanging plants in a waterfall in the present river Piedra, and on the left, a Pleistocene counterpart of the river Ebron. Another example of tufa, in this case, uh, form on moss mats in a waterfall, a Pleistocene waterfall. Let's have a look at the factors and scales of a study. The factors that control tufa formation can be grouped into extrinsic, such as climate, tectonics, and bedrock, and intrinsic, such as flora and soil, uh, chemical and physical properties of water, but let, let's see them in detail in the next illustration. Climate controls temperature and water availability, precipitation, and these influence the hydrology and then the biological components and flora and soil development. 
tectonics uh, through a, a structure and uh, the, the uh, lithology, bedrock lithology may condition the basin morphology and uh, some physical properties of the water bodies depend on them. And bedrock lithology can condition the chemical properties or some chemical properties of water and thus the calcite saturation level or index. All these parameters influence the formation and preservation of tufas in the geological record. Well, you are familiar with the reactions that govern calcium carbonate precipitation. The key point is the amount of uh, dissolved uh, CO2 in water. Temperature um, influences calcite and CO2 solubility in water. And uh, CO2 loss from water uh, can also occur by increasing turbulence, uh, for, for instance, uh, through uh, physical agitation, but also uh, biologically mediated through photosynthesis and by evaporation. With respect to plants and other organisms, either uh, micro or both micro and macro, uh, they can uh, be sites for uh, calcite nucleation and precipitation. They can trap calcite particles and they can contribute through the uh, photosynthetic uh, activity, as I have just uh, mentioned. The production of EPS may be important, either inhibiting or favoring uh, calcite precipitation. Therefore, we need water with calcium and bicarbonate and flora, and also changes in CO2 content, content by uh, either of, of the uh, uh, processes I have just mentioned. There are many places in the world where at present uh, we can find these conditions and to face actively precipitating. In the Iberian range, to the, north, uh, to the north of the Iberian Peninsula, conditions are ideal for formation of, or tufa formation at present, and were ideal also in the Quaternary. At present, um, uh, in the Iberian range, climate if, is uh, of continental Mediterranean type. There are thick Mesozoic carbonate rocks that constitute the aquifer from which uh, rivers are provided with calcium and um, bicarbonate water. Moreover, rivers have changes in slope along the courses that favor CO2 loss and thus calcite precipitation. In this geological map uh, of the northeast of the Iberian Peninsula, we can observe the location of present and past fluvial valleys with tufa deposits through the Iberian ranges marked with uh, red uh, points. In detail, in this other map, uh, we can see here that the tufa depositing rivers we uh, studied are the Añamaza, Piedra, sorry, Mesa, Piedra, Hebron, Mijares, Martín, and all uh, were and are still sourced by, the, uh, by an aquifer in Jurassic and Cretaceous rocks here in green color. Uh, yes, in green color, sorry. Most of the aforementioned parameters can act or vary on different time scales. Two extreme uh, separate scales of study are represented by a lamination uh, with weekly to decadal uh, cycles or tendency and uh, longer cycles with 10 to 100,000 uh, year uh, cycles or tendencies. Common properties and other characteristics that we can get information from are texture, structure, biological components, stable isotope composition, trace elements, and thickness, the depositional rates. And in the case of longer cycles, uh, through stratigraphy, sedimentology, uh, and geochemistry. Uh, this talk is, is dealing uh, with the uh, small scale um, case with lamination mainly. As for the short cycles, texture, thickness, and stable um, uh, isotope composition of uh, laminated fluvial records reflect or can reflect seasonal to pluriannual variations in water temperature and precipitation. In this case, we have the uh, oxygen variation of uh, 
a deposit in a drainage pipe in, in the river Piedra. And in, in this other case is um, a record uh, in a river in Japan. And uh, uh, note the uh, uh, coincidence between the calcite packing density evolution and the oxygen evolution. On the other extreme, 10 to 100,000 uh, year cycles in the quaternary correspond to glacial and interglacial uh, cycles. Note here that uh, in Spain, the uh, highest frequency of tufa occurred during the warm marine isotope stage uh, five. On the right, uh, the example, we have the, the example of the Anyamasa tufas, which mostly form uh, during warm periods, marine isotopic uh, periods here in pink. This is one, uh, five, seven, and nine but also in the cool marine isotope stage A. Let's see now how present-day systems are key to understanding past scenarios. I'll compare present and past uh, sub-environments and phases with the example of the uh, river pier. Well, present-day systems are key to understanding past scenarios because they show a wide array of depositional settings, sub-environments, and sedimentary phases. And because some processes occurring in these systems can be detected on human time scales. And also because sedimentation rates can be as high as 1.7 centimeters per year and even higher uh, depending on conditions. Therefore, present day TUFA systems are suitable for studies with different uh, perspectives aiming to search for physical, chemical, and biological processes. The analysis of these processes can be done by periodic study or monitoring over sufficient time span of different uh, parameters. For instance, physical parameters such as temperature, precipitation, texture, structure, the biological components or composition, and chemical parameters of water and sediment, together with the aim, aim to characterize the depositional settings, their phases, and evolution through space and time. The periodic study includes the characterization of sub-environments and sedimentary phases, uh, sampling sediment and water. And this sediment um, uh, can be sampled in situ, but also on uh, uh, substrates, tablets, uh, to uh, control or to know the deposition rates. Uh, we'll, we'll be back to this in a while. And in water, we, we, we measure temperature, velo uh, velocity, depth, and uh, also the, all the uh, chemical composition, including the stable isotopes. In this geological map, uh, we see the, um, uh, or we, we have two of the river we, we studied, Mesa and uh, Piedra. Piedra means stone. In the river stone or in the river Piedra, flowing from south uh, to north through Jurassic and uh, Cretaceous rocks, we monitor up to 24 sites from uh, headwaters to the entrance to a to a reservoir. The fossil uh, quaternary tufa are indicated here in black color. As previously mentioned, climate in the uh, River Piedra Valley is continental Mediterranean with strong seasonal contrasts of uh, temperature and precipitation. And mean water discharge was 1.8, uh, sorry, 0 0.8 uh, uh, cubic uh, seconds cubic uh, meters per second over the study period. This is the topographic profile of the river Piedra, and the mean slope is 1.3%, uh, uh, but with higher slope uh, stretches, higher slope stretches with important breaks along the river. Note here that the main springs occur upstream. There are also smaller or minor springs downstream. Quaternary tufa outcrops are indicated here in, uh, with these uh, gray dots. And uh, labels P1 to P24 are the uh, corresponding study points. These images show the irregular slope 
along the river Piedra with vertical force, step cascades, and gently sloping uh, stretches. Up to six sub-environments were defined based on, based on morphological features, physical flow conditions, and floral associations, and the sedimentary phases uh, were characterized at each sub-environment. I'll show you them in the following images. One of the sub-environments is that of slow flowing water areas with loose line mud sediment as shown uh, below in this plan, plan view of present sediment. And also uh, in this uh, sub-environments, we, we have hydrophilus plants, hydrophilus vegetation. Uh, below is an image of a Pleistocene upgrowing calcite coated plant boundstone that form in such conditions. Dam areas with a slow flow develop upstream of barrage cascades. In the dam areas, the deposits consist of uh, lime, mud, and sand, and diverse types of carbonate components, as we can see here in this Holocene example, where the arrows point to uh, gastropods. In the barrage cascade, with fast to moderate flow, the, uh, the deposits consist of moss mats, filamentous algae, gramina, and cyanobacteria. We have this Pleistocene uh, example uh, up on the, on the left. Fast flow areas are devoid of moss and uh, macroscopic algae and typically consist of laminating microbial sediment or deposits. To compare below, these are Pleistocene stromatolites that form in a cascade. And on the left, on the left we can observe the laminated structure. In step cascades, with fast to moderate flow, moss mats, filamentous algae, bacteria, as well as some hanging plants are the main components. Below, a Pleistocene deposit, and on the left, a banded deposit form of calcite coated moss stems. Finally, vertical cascades are inhabited by moss mats and hanging plants that become coated by calcite as can be seen uh, here. This is another vertical cascade with the corresponding cave developed below and behind the waterfall. This is the name in, in Spanish is the Gruta Iris. There, uh, calcite coated stems are overgrown and speleothems form. Now we look at how we collected sediment on tablets. Tablets are 25 by 15 by 2 centimeters were installed at different sites and sub-environments along the riverbed, fixed with a rope and pins. Each tablet uh, has or had three screws on which, the, on which the measurement device was set. Once again, the River Piedra profile with the uh, position of the 24 tablets along the course. The measurement device consisted of a rectangular frame with 50 positions to make measurements with the caliper. The caliper measures the distance from the sediment surface up to here. The higher the deposit on tablet, the smaller the height. We considered autumn and winter the cool period and spring and summer the warm, the warm period. Tablets were installed at the end of winter and stayed in their position until the end of summer. Then took them out from the river to the laboratory uh, for measurements, samples, etc. And after a week later, the same tablets were put back to, the, to their sites, the same sites, until the next six month period. So the differences in, in, in height between consecutive measurements represented the increase, increase or decrease in sediment thickness. Sediment and water were sampled at all the sites in the middle of the cool and in the middle of the warm periods. Every three months, water, velo water velocity, water depth, and water temperature were measured. 
Water temperature was also measured hourly by uh, Hubble sensors. This periodical monitoring was performed in four rivers in the Iberian Ranges, in the Piedra River over 13 years. And in this case, several sets of tablets were needed. To have a better idea, here we are at two sampling times. The cascade was partially frozen. Guess, guess uh, what stage was better suited. <laughs> Now let's see the results from the experiment in the River Piedra, first concerning hydrochemistry, which indicates that water is of calcium sulfate bicarbonate type. Sulfate is a minimum, but is, uh, so, uh, the, the, is calcium bicarbonate type with increasing pH from uh, 0.3, we see here 0.3 and the location here on the, on the profile and uh, from, from point three downstream, including the Monasterio de Piedra Natural Park. There is also uh, an increase in the saturation index of calcite from point three downstream, and note that the, the, value, the values are higher in the warm periods than in the cool periods, but in all cases uh, over 0.5, which indicates that chemical conditions are good for calcite precipitation uh, all through the year. Contents of calcium and alkalinity are shown here. Uh, the values increase right after the, um, the calcium uh, increase, increase, increase right after uh, water springs uh, upstream and downstream. Let's move now on to the characteristics of deposits on tablets. And uh, well, once the tablets were definitely removed, they were cut through sections perpendicular to the flow direction. And the six month intervals were, were recognized by plotting the corresponding measurements taken over the 13 years. The deposit on this tablet formed in fast flowing water areas. Note thicker and denser deposits in the uh, war periods and thinner and less uh, and more porous deposits in the cool periods. Note also the laminated structure as uh, this is a stromatolite deposit, as we'll see in the following images taken in the uh, scanning electron microscope that show that um, um, the deposit. Deposits consist of calcite tubes that form by calcite precipitation around uh, filamentous cyanobacteria. The most common cyanobacteria was formidium incrustatum. What is also interesting is that each six month deposit consisted of several lamina. We'll go back to this in a while. Thick deposits consisting of uh, coated moss and filamentous algae, as well as stromatolites form in step cascades. The identification of six month intervals wasn't always clear due to erosional processes acting in these uh, cascades in this environment. In these photomicrographs, uh, cross sections of algae and uh, cyanobacterial tubes are identified identified and, and also here on, on the SEM uh, pictures. Uh, diatoms and um, EPS are abundant in these uh, deposits. The deposits in the slow flowing water areas have poor to absent lamination and erosion is common. If you look here, uh, uh, there is a warm, a warm de uh, interval deposit that is lacking. Clumps of calcite crystals and diatoms are common and rarely, but um, uh, very thin stromatolite layers may form uh, in this sub-environment. Finally, carbonate deposits in upstream and downstream sites uh, close to the springs were very thin to absent. Well, in this graph, 
the bars express uh, the six month variations of the positional rates in millimeters from 1999 to 2012 with a cyclic pattern, higher rates, higher deposits in work periods than in cool periods. Uh, work periods in red, cool periods in, um, in blue. But there are some exceptions as we can see here or over here. In the graph uh, below, the arrows on the bars uh, indicate tablets that yielded negative deposition values. And some of these uh, correlate with some high discharge events as expressed in this graph uh, where we have the maximum instantaneous discharge. Thus, these exceptions of some of these exceptions can be related to large water discharge events uh, that uh, caused erosion and or water dilution, provoking the uh, reversal of the six month pattern. Therefore, the position rates are higher in work periods than in cool periods due to seasonal variations of temperature that uh, influence the solubility of CO2 and calcite in water and also plant um, and prokaryotic development, uh, both the plant volume and the intensity of photosynthetic activity, though there are exceptions mostly due to high water discharge events. As for sub-environments and phases, the higher rates uh, uh, occur in fast flow uh, areas with stromatolites and uh, with mean, uh, mean, uh, yearly mean uh, rates of 13.75 millimeters. And these are followed by a step waterfalls with continuous flow with moss and filamentous algae bangstones and stromatolites with yearly mean of, um, a yearly mean of 8.25 millimeters. And the other phases had much lower uh, rates. This is indicating that the higher rates occur where flow promotes CO2 degassing. That's it in, in fast and turbulent flow, with uh, phases being stromatolites and most and only bounces. Concerning variations through space, in this graph, it is clear that the position greatly increases where the riverbed slope increases. Other important point is that a first calcite deposition occurs approximately eight kilometers uh, down from the uh, upstream spring, about uh, point, uh, 0.3, which suggests that some distance is needed to allow CO2 loss from water. And uh, downstream, downstream of, of the park calcite deposition uh, again decreases due to uh, low, uh, sorry, due to CO2 input by springs. Therefore, uh, calcite precipitation begins some distance away from the main water springs and increases rapidly with a slope increase. This demonstrate, uh, demonstrates that uh, CO2 degassing is controlling or governing the formation of tufa. From the above facts or results, we can say that tufa formation is controlled by physico both physicochemical dominantly and biological processes. What we see here is a photomicrograph of a thin section in a stromatolite formed in fast flowing conditions. The six month periods are indicated in blue, cool periods, and in red or pink, uh, warm periods. Within each six month interval, we can see that there are different uh, ranks or levels of uh, lamination, and the lamina can be dense, porous, and macrocrystalline. Thus, there are uh, thick intervals of dense fabric, for instance here, form of several uh, simple lamina, and there are thinner intervals, for instance here, form of dominant porous lamina. Lamination is more complex than expected. 
Something interesting is how uh, texture and thickness variations correlate with water temperature and water discharge. As these data were available for the uh, time of deposition on, um, on, on this tablet from uh, 2009 to uh, uh, 2012. Denser and thicker deposits are formed or correlate with higher temperature months and thinner and um, porous deposits are better developed in cool periods. Moreover, erosion features like here and here and macrocrystalline lamina here, here, or for instance, uh, down here, correlated with high, this high water discharge events as indicated here by the peaks in discharge. Thus, lamination is complex and represents both, both periodic and aperiodic processes. Periodic um, of seasonal and shorter time parameters, such as temperature and insulation, and also aperiodic processes such as uh, discharge events. The stable isotope composition is a powerful tool to test whether tufa deposits are suitable for climate and environmental studies. In this uh, a stromatolite sample, there is a clear cyclic variation of the oxygen 18 through the successive six month intervals. Because oxygen isotopic composition of water hardly varied or varies uh, through the year, it can be assumed that calcite oxygen um, 18 variations are reflecting the temperature effects on fractionation during calcite precipitation. As for the carbon uh, values, uh, these are typical of uh, water having a, uh, a biogenic uh, CO2 origin, and there is no um, um, acyclic pattern, uh, perhaps due to the uh, number of factors and parameters that, that influence it. If we compare the isotopic values of synchronous uh, deposits on tablets in the River Piedra, we can see that the uh, variation in the uh, oxygen is better developed in stromatolites than in the step uh, waterfalls with bryophytes, with moss. Using the isotope composition of um, oxygen in water, the calculated water temperatures here in red are in good, in good agreement with the uh, actual measured water temperature in yellow cycle, circles, and also are parallel to the air temperatures uh, for each six month period. The air temperatures are here with these black dots. Therefore, stromatolites are very continuous records sensitive to calendar duration processes. Lastly, we'll look at some at, at an example of past uh, tufa laminated deposit in the Piedra River, Piedra Valley, and compare it with a similar situation uh, in the present river. So let's compare texture and stable isotopes in uh, two stromatolite records of the River Piedra formed in, sm in small cascade, cascades. Uh, in the case of the middle uh, Pleistocene, uh, we have the outcrop here, the name is Los Bancales. And the other example is the present day stromatolite form on a tablet over um, 12 years. This is tablet 14 located here. Here you can see the outcrop of the deposit form uh, in the Pleistocene cascade. And below uh, is the small cascade where the tablet uh, was monitored for 12 years. The Pleistocene stromatolites form at the, at the downstream portion of a wedge-shaped uh, deposit. And in the image uh, here below on the right, uh, we can see uh, one of the places where we took samples for textural and stable isotope analysis we are going to see in the next images. In the Pleistocene stromatolite, uh, we could distinguish two types of laminate. Those with the small crystals, type B, and those with large, large crystals, type A. 
thickness of type B is uh, larger than uh, uh, thickness uh, of type A. And uh, 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 the cyanobacterial filaments are more abundant in the type B than in the type A. Let's see now that the stable isotopes of samples taken in each lamina, each lamina, sorry, one per lamina, yielded an irregular pattern for the carbon here in red. In contrast, the oxygen in blue squares shows a nice cyclic uh, pattern with the large crystal uh, lamina having higher values indicating lower temperature and the small crystal lamina ha having lower values indicating higher uh, temperature. The calculated uh, water difference between these two types of lamina is 7 to 8.1 uh, degrees. And assuming uh, each pair of lamina form in one year, sedimentation rate is or was 8.3 millimeters per year in this specimen. In the recent deposit, sedimentation rate was 16 millimeters per year. There are dense composite uh, lamina, we can see here, and porous composite, composite lamina, we can see here, that form in um, warm and uh, cool uh, periods. Both contain cyanobacterial filaments, calcite cubes, and there are also macrocrystalline lamina, for instance, here, or for instance, uh, here in the detail. Uh, mostly, uh, these macrocrystalline lamina occur in the cool period um, uh, deposits. The measured water uh, temperature difference is uh, 7 uh, to 8 uh, uh, degrees if we consider winter versus summer, and 5 degrees if we consider cool versus warm, warm six month periods. That's not far from the Pleistocene estimates. As can be seen on the table, there is a good agreement between measured and calculated water temperatures for several uh, sediment uh, six month intervals. And uh, well, there is no doubt that these deposits are excellent records of uh, water temperature. Moreover, a stable, as, stable isotopes uh, from high resolution sampling of a small uh, portion. Of, uh, of this stromatolite, this model stromatolite from uh, 2008 to 2009, yielded a very good agreement between calculated water temperature and uh, uh, measured water temperature. Note here that uh, water temperature is hourly and monthly. And something fascinating is that it was possible to detect an erosional hiatus at the end of the winter, associated with an increase in discharge. Lastly, for a longer interval, the 13-year record of stromatolite deposits on, 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 on tablets in one of the river sites, again, showed a good agreement between um, the calculated water uh, temperature in green and the measured water temperature in red. The water temperature tendency here is parallel to that of the air temperature for the same period in this area, both uh, marking or indicating an increase of almost two degrees from 1999 to 2012. Therefore, fluvial stromatolites are high resolution records of uh, periodic and aperiodic changes in climatic, hydrological, and environmental conditions reflected through the um, above mentioned uh, parameters, operating in, um, in, on monthly, decadal, and likely longer scales. And uh, well, I'd like to finish up with this refreshing picture. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, 
thank you very much, Concha. It was it was super super amazing, super interesting. Um, it's really nice to see like um, actual experiments in sedimentology, especially with this kind of long term, at least long term. I mean, fourteen years in the Shoshika case, not long term, but still long enough to to have these kind of records. So now we are open to questions. Please yeah. write your questions in the chat in the chat, and then be sure to send it to everyone. Also, please remember to write your name and where are you watching us. Um, so in the meantime that we are waiting for some questions from the public, I also have some questions. Okay. One of these is like, I'm always interested in trying to imagine how is the potential of preservation of these like uh, seasonal uh, signals in the geological record? I mean, if we go to like something older than the Pleistocene, do you think that it's still possible to, to measure like these uh, seasonal records? Yes, it, it's possible. Yes, it is possible. Now we are uh, we are working on Miocene oncolites, um, stromatolites, and, and we can find seasonality uh, from from the stable isotope composition and also textural uh, variations. Wow, that's super high resolution. <laughs> I don't I don't know um, in the case of older. Uh, deposits, but uh, in Miocene oncolites and stromatolites, it is possible. The, wow. the problem with tufa is that mm, mm, their the, uh, potential of preservation is low. So, um, right. So, we have another question from Stephen okay. from Derby UK. Mm -hmm. He said, Thanks for the great presentation. Sorry if I missed this, but have you any idea if the associated microbial communities change downstream? Uh, oh, interesting question. Uh, we don't think so. We did uh, uh, a study of the um, uh, bacteria, bacterial content, and also um, a study of the cyanobacterial uh, composition of several sites along, the, along several rivers. And in the case, uh, in all the cases, but in this case, in the River Piedra, there, there, there was no, no change. There was no change. There was some uh, change in the um, proportions of some uh, cyanobacteria, depending on the um, uh, flow conditions. Mm. For instance, we noticed that uh, um, for medium incrustatum is present in most uh, fast flowing water areas, while uh, and this is and this is the most abundant uh, cyanobacteria. But in slow flowing water areas, we found uh, for medium incrustatum, but also um, I don't remember it's for medium aero, aerogenum um, another. A different species uh, that was developed there, mm -hmm. but um, as far as I know, and from the studies we we did, um, there were no uh, important variations. Fascinating, fascinating. We have another question from Steve from Brunel University in the UK. Uh, he said, "Great talk, thanks. Could you say?" A little bit more about what controls the differences in layers of an individual stromatolite seems to show a lot of variations layer by layer in stromatolites, but what can causes the changes? The changes uh, from one one layer uh, to, to the another layer, layer, yeah. To another layer yeah. layer. Well, it can be changes in temperature, it can be uh, changes in the um, chemical composition referring to the uh, um, calcium and bicarbonate uh, concentration and also the CO2 concentration. So uh, when, uh, um, the, um, we differentiate the lamine, uh, cool and warm lamine through porosity and also uh, through the thickness of calcite around the filaments the uh, cyanobacterial filaments. I don't know if, if, if that makes sense. Stephen? Uh, let's wait if Stephen says if it is makes sense or not, but I think that, yeah, he said, thank you very much. 
Um, can there also be microbial community changes from one la layer to the next? I don't think so. Mm. You mean, for instance, uh, uh, through a year, a change? No, we haven't found that. Yeah, exactly, because I mean, the um, layer by layer is year by year. So yeah, no, there is so no the, change. The, concerning the cyanobacteria, through a year, uh, it's possible to find that the um, activity is uh, lesser. Mm. And then the amount of uh, calcite around cyanobacteria is uh, smaller. But the mm, uh, microbes themselves uh, don't change. Interesting. We have another question here from Sangita from India. Oh. And she said, very informative talk, thanks. I was interested to know if there, is, if there were any difference in the type of bacteria or algae uh, comparing between the seasons, warm versus cold, that contributed for biogasification? It's like kind of similar question. It's, well, I think I, I, have, I have answered. Yeah, yeah, question. I think that this is like already, uh, already answered. Uh, the difference is, uh, as I said, the difference between warm and cool is um, porosity, thickness, and um, thickness of the, of the deposit, and also thickness of the coating around the cyanobacteria. Cool. So we are still open to more, more questions. Uh, and in the meantime, I'm more than a question, it's like a comment. I'm really surprised that you have like um, thicker or more deposition of uh, traumatic, of more growing of these uh, bacteria um, in the, in the um, faster flows. I was expecting to have this kind of um, deposition of higher in more quiet words. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that was... this, no, but this is, uh, I think this is very easy to, to explain uh, because if you think in the, uh, if you have high slope, uh, water has a higher velocity and higher turbulence. So CO2, uh, yeah. easily uh, uh, the gases yeah. yeah and you promote uh, calcium carbonate precipitation no that makes a lot of sense actually when you said that it was like wow right right yeah uh, so we have another question from dorothy from derby university mm -hmm. she said have you looked at the deposit in ponds lakes fed by such fluvial carbonates accumulation or layer textures Sorry, accumulation or layer textures? So the, the question is if we can find I, I can really the answer. same in, in, in lakes. Yes. Have you looked at depositing ponds or lakes fed by such fluid too carbon? Far. Too far. I, I suppose she's referring to too far deposits in lakes. Yeah. Um, I studied an example in Argentina many years ago and there was yeah it, it was a lacustrian uh, deposit a uh, laminated lacustrian deposit but now I, I, I don't remember exactly the differences well the problem is that in in, in lakes unless you have a lot of um, wave action and a lot of degassing the um, precipitation or deposition rate is going to be low and maybe detecting uh, these changes on human time scale is not so easy in lakes as in uh, rivers. I don't know if, if that- Yeah, I, I think that the question was related um, if you see like the lakes that was fit, fed by these fluvial carbonates, but probably do, do you have these um, rivers ends in lakes or not? If if the rivers were answering if the, the, the rivers are going to lakes, these rivers? No, in fact, the, the river Piedra and, and the river Mesa enter a reservoir. And from that point, there is no too far to downward. Okay, interesting. So Stephen from Derby again, he said that rather than millimeter per year, have you looked at the carbonates in terms of grains per year 
specifically, specifically as a mode of atmospheric carbon sequestration? <laughs> we waited. <laughs> we <laughs> waited the deposits um, at the beginning, but we, we forgot about this because <laughs> it was a lot of work. <laughs> And it depending it depended of on for instance um, um, humidity and a lot of things so uh, we we ended up um, um, with that that and, and we we just um, studied the tablets the thickness on tablets so okay we have another question from Takel. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correct, from Ethiopia, said, it is a great word, thank you. Could you say something about the effect of rainfall in these deposits, either in chemistry or thickness? The, sorry? The effect of rainfall. The effect of rainfall. Yeah. Yes, if, well, but rainfall, um, if there is a long period of precipitation of if you have a very high uh, water discharge, uh, you can find uh, water dilution. And if water is dil diluted, uh, uh, calcite pre precipitation is not so uh, uh, favored. So it, it may be, um, you, you may get uh, lower rates. By the way, I didn't, mentioned uh, in the talk, but we also uh, did the chemical uh, analysis to, uh, to know the, um, we say the mass balance, uh, mass, mass balance analysis, and uh, it, it mass balance analysis are consistent with a thickness measurements. I don't oh. know if, yeah. I think that. Well, the other effect of a high um, um, uh, discharge uh, due to precipitation can be uh, erosion. Right. But uh, well, it depends on, the, on each occasion. <laughs> no, but, but it's cool because you have like all the parameters, the external factors control. Yeah, yeah. So we have another question from Olga from Danst, Poland. Uh, she said, thank you for your presentation. Sorry, I'm not an expert, but did you identify any taxon of diatoms? Is it possible to consider them as an indicator of same sort of climatic conditions or water conditions? I have no idea. <laughs> uh, there are, well, the, when you take sediment at present, recent, present sediment, you can find lots and lots of uh, diatoms. Once the sediment um, is uh, getting older, the diatoms disappear. I don't know why, but uh, I, I don't know. I don't know the, the uh, I haven't, or we haven't identified the diatoms and, and we don't know if, if the, the, they could be uh, an indicator, but it, it's a good idea. I, I'll check it out. Uh, okay. Okay. So we have another question from Khalil from Morocco. Uh, he said, very nice presentation, Professor Concha. I just wonder how calcite or aragonite precipitation could be biologically influenced in the context of a cascade or waterfall where the physical chemical processes are predominant, regardless of the fact that they provide nucleation sites. I, I can read it again because it was long. How calcite or, ag or aragonite precipitation could be biologically influenced in the context of okay. a cascade? I understand the question. Yeah, I think I think that person is referring to the fact that um, in 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 these um, 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 fast flow uh, conditions, the uh, mechanical outgassing or the mechanical uh, processes are dominant, really dominant. So. It is expected uh, that biologically mediated uh, processes are more difficult to uh, identify or even detect. I think so. Um, uh, I, I can't. I can't. Yeah, I can't say anything else. <laughs> but this like triggered me a question. Uh, do you think, Concha, that um, this kind of memory, like thinking like in a cascade or like in a waterfall? 
uh, could be like a place uh, somehow, somehow hostile for bacteria to live or not at all? If there are some areas hostile for them? Yeah. I suppose so. Mm. Uh, but bacteria are very, are very strong. Are right. very yeah, strong. yeah, they, they can live wherever. <laughs> Almost. They can live wherever. So, uh, in fact, they can be indicators of uh, pollution. So, so when you uh, depend, I, I don't know, but I I know there are uh, colleagues who work on uh, bacteria as indicators of pollution. Okay, so Khalil again said, uh, I have another question. This concerns the large scale you have mentioned. What do you think about using sequence stratigraphy terminology in settings that involve an enlarged bar barrage cascade and an extensive dam area behind? where accommodation would be mainly controlled by the stacking fire. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we have uh, in our studies of the uh, quaternary record, we have uh, considered uh, the different uh, stages or units, the positional units that can be, um, that can be uh, recognized. But, uh, well, uh, you can uh, sequence stratigraphy. Uh, well, why not? But uh, it's not as easier as <laughs> as it seems. <laughs> as easy as it seems. Okay. Thank you very very much. Uh, we have like maybe last question from Darrell from Canada. He said, "Are your rivers influenced by seasonal differences in agricultural runoff?" In, mm, they should be, they should be because uh, in our uh, Mediterranean climate, uh, there is a big difference between uh, spring and summer and winter. So uh, the, the agriculture is uh, better developed in, in the warm season, in the warm seasons. And concerning rainfall, um, uh, in this uh, area, uh, Western Mediterranean, um, the highest uh, precipitation uh, rates are in spring and autumn. And very, very have, cool. we have considered all, all these parameters. Thank you very much, Concha. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, you all for attending also to this very interesting talk. Um, and don't forget that we are running a bi-weekly seminar now during the summer. So please join us in our next seminar, which will be in August, and will be entitled Understanding Late Holocene Relative Sea Level Change with Mangrove Sediments in Western Pacific Ocean by Juliet Sefton from Monash University. So have a nice week and see you soon. <laughs>